everybody. Welcome to our preview of this month's NeuroTribes Book Club. Now, typically the full two-hour discussion of the book NeuroTribes by Steve Silberman is only available to our patrons. But so that you get a sense of what you might be missing out on, we decided to put out a little preview of the first 30-ish minutes or so of our discussion, kind of giving our our, uh, sense, uh, kind of a little bit of history of the book as well as some of our initial impressions. If you'd like to hear the full two-hour podcast as well as earn two CEs, just head on over to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track and sign up at our $10 level. But anyway, enough about that. Here's our preview of our discussion of NeuroTribes. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the ABA Inside Track Book Club discussion of NeuroTribes by Steve Silberman. How are you doing? I'm your host for this fabulous discussion of NeuroTribes. We, well, we assume it will be. We haven't You're, done it yet. <laughs> what? You're like doing the upfront sell on your doing own. The it's going to be the best podcast show. you ever did here about <laughs> NeuroTribes. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz. And with me, as always, are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob. It's Diana. And it's me, Jackie, coming from your library live. That's right. <laughs> and we're also joined by our special our special guest. It's his second book club appearance. We are Woo-hoo! very excited to have him back. Special guest, please introduce yourself. Alan Haberman, special educator, at least formerly, and sl- just slogging my way slowly to becoming a behavior analyst, too. Woo! Oh, boy. So You're we, almost there. We're, yeah, so close. So close. So we are here talking to, uh, this is just going out on the Patreon. It's going to be our nice long discussion of the book NeuroTribes. This is our second one of these. We're going to be talking all about the, how many pages is this book? Like 400, 500, it feels longer. I don't know what they did with the margins. 548. To, it's a very long book. Not but, as long as Bleak House. <laughs> you know, Bleak House it, is a thousand pages. I had to read that for a class. We'll put Bleak House on the next the whole poll. Class. The next poll will put Bleak House. Dickens. Behavior analysis and Dickens will be our Ooh. next. Nope, 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 nope. Not interested. There's a lot of punishment. There, there actually is only 484 pages of written text. Okay, so it's like only half the length of Bleak House. <laughs> it's only halfway there. So this is, like I said, our book club for our for our patrons. We're going to be talking all about Neurotribe's book that was voted on. By listeners uh, and by us, by us. Well, we, we 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 skewed the vote by saying, "Hey, everybody, why don't you vote for NeuroTribes?" And we we used our we used our position to to try to pressure everyone into voting for it. Some people did not, so they were not they were not susceptible. That's right. We're proud of you. We're proud of you for going against the grain. But you know what? Uh, I think there was a lot of push for for NeuroTribes also from us. So uh, this is a book, uh, the, sub t- the subscript of the title, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity, I think is sort of, sort of sums up what we'll be discussing tonight, because this is not a behavior analytic book exactly. However, we all agree, regardless of the fact that I think we all have some points that uh, might detract a little bit from our enjoyment of reading the book, that there is so much in here for anyone who is interested in or currently working with autistic individuals. There's a lot here that you may not have learned in graduate school or your training programs, or you may not have just, you know, picked up along the way. So there, there's a lot of value in this, in this tome. So, I guess we should just get going because we've only got so much time and we've got hundreds and hundreds of pages to cover. So let's start with a little background information on NeuroTribes. And so there's a great preface where author Steve Silverman sort of talks about why he wrote the book. But uh, right before we started recording, Alan let us know that he actually had seen Steve Silverman talk. And it was, it was Tech Saba, you said, Alan, you saw him? Well, it was the Texas, Texas Autism Conference. Texas Autism Conference. Yes, Texas Autism Conference. Sorry. And he spoke about writing this book. So, Alan, I'm just, I'm just going to let you start us off with uh, kind of tell us, uh, you know, what Steve Silverman talked about the genesis of writing NeuroTribes. Yeah, um, I think for the important thing to know about Steve Silverman is that he's not a behavior analyst. He's not a person with autism or any kind of he's not neurodiverse in any way that he considers notable. Um, he's a science writer. He studied. Um, let's see, English Lit, I think at Berkeley. And, you know, right? yeah. So this is not his, like, passion in life was not to become an autism advocate. But in writing an article for Wired in 2001 about what he called the geek syndrome, which was about, you know, what was then called Asperger syndrome, he just 
met a lot of people in Silicon Valley who were on the Asperger spectrum and who had children with more um, with autism, but with more significant needs than what we associate with Asperger syndrome. And yeah, so this is he wrote that article and he was getting every day an email about it. He thought, well, maybe maybe this is something I should explore and turn into like a book. And this might be this might be something worth me pursuing um, beyond just an article. And so, yeah, that brought, you know, he came in contact with Temple Grandin a lot, um, became really involved in the autism rights movement, which we see a lot in here and uh, in the book. And yeah, it's just fascinating the way that he, he wants to, he's very clear that he is, um, what is the quote that I have? He's not making light of autism. He's just advocating for understanding. And I really like that he, you know, he really humble in what he's trying to do. He's not trying to like be in people's face. He's like, we should really understand, understand people with autism and the role that they have and deserve in our society and how that to be better, not just for people with autism, but people with ADHD and people with all, all different types of, you know, neurological or psychological disabilities. Um, so yeah, no, he talked, you know, it was fascinating to hear him talk about people like Lorna Wing in the book about, oh, we thought autism was a super rare thing based on institutionalization yeah. rates. And it turns out it's about one in every one to 200 people, which is mm-hmm. similar to what we see now. How did we go, you know, all of basically human history Humanity. without, <laughs> yeah, yeah like human history without having an idea that these people, um, were around. Um, he's also very clear that things like med- waiting for medical science isn't enough that we need supports now, which is a big part of the disability rights separate, but not, yeah. not separate. Separate is not equal that yes. people with disabilities don't have to wait for, um, society to catch up to them. We need to do it actively now. Um, yeah, and he just talked a lot about the people that he's encountered over the years, um, talked a lot about um, people like Asperger and Leo Connor and the harm that they often did in sort of being these lone wolves in psychology. And they're going to like lead this big breakthrough when we had an idea of the needs of people with autism and effective therapies before the first world, before the second world war. We just went on this psychoanalytic, you know, uh, oh, what's the word on segue, and it didn't help anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, and so that, and then just was a sort of a breakdown of the book in general, which we'll sort of talk about. But yeah, it was just really fascinating. It didn't feel like he was trying to sell his book, he just really is, you know, someone with a passion for journalism and, um, like a very creative soul. He's a very humble guy. Um, I think his husband is a high school science teacher. So, that, you know, he's just a cool person, like what you would meet who ha- who used his pulpit for expanding society and making it more diverse. It, you definitely get the sense of, of, of the book that he was, he was just so passionate about the topic and that sort of it's in some ways it re, it it makes the book read a lot easier. I think some chapters read a little more like I got so excited about this tangent, so here's a whole chapter about it, and you're sort of oh okay, I I maybe wish you'd used this time to write about something you know a different part of the the the, the scope you know the, the scope of the issue of of autism and and, and aut- you know autistic rights, but you know it's hard to it's hard to get frustrated with someone who clearly is just so excited to share all of this information and. When I was reading the acknowledgments, he, he definitely was trying to talk with lots of different people. At what, this isn't a book where it's, I just talked to scientists or I just talked to researchers or I just talked to any one group. A lot of families, a lot of parents of autistic children, a lot of adult, uh, you know, autistic adults. I, know, I, I thought it was funny. I was reading the acknowledgments and he thanked uh, Colin Malloy, who is the, the, the lead songwriter and, and uh, lead singer of the, the band, The Decemberists. And that sort of led me down a rabbit hole. I didn't know that Colin Malloy has an autistic child and had done, uh, you know, some interviews with the, uh, like some of the autism networks online. And so apparently had discussions with him about his own experience. Didn't even make it in the book. Uh, but mm-hmm. got a special thanks in there. So there must That's be so much. I don't know if they're going to talk about <laughs> this. Tell me more about 
what's what's our album that we love? What, tell me more about Picaresque. How did you develop? <laughs> tell me about the Crane Wife. One um, of my favorite articles reviewing December is said called him Donkey Voice Singer, <laughs> Colin Malloy. <laughs> Which is really neither here nor there, but no. it's the only thing I've contributed thus far. Well, I think we should take a Steve Silberman approach to this discussion. <laughs> and just if we have an, a topic that we want to talk about for a 500 pages, you know what? We're going to do it. We're just going to go. All right. So I'll, I'll say my, my piece now. I think we are going to review this book and we ha- I think we'll need to be careful in our balancing of our critique of the book as a literary work versus our critique of the messages that they're att- he's attempting to portray. Yes. In the book. And there's some of each. Yes. The other piece I want to make sure I say here at the beginning is one of our listeners brought up the question of how much do we love the title Neuro Tribes? Is that potentially appropriative of Native American groups by calling this Neuro Tribes? I was expecting it to be a post-apocalyptic thriller about a variety of tribes of neurodiverse groups fighting it out for the scant resources yes, left on planet Earth. Joke to me for a while. <laughs> and uh, I was a little disappointed. This big old science book. I do think it's important to acknowledge that maybe since this was written, that people have maybe thought about that term a little bit more and mm-hmm. might, he might have chosen something different if it were written in 2020. But And just to push back in a sort of conversational way, the term tribe is not, the, the term tribe is from like Greco-Roman um history it, it's the the tribe the tribune and hmm. the, the tribe of the uh the the different social ranks in roman society especially so i think it is it's very much true that we need to be aware of that but the word tribe has been used in art and literature beyond um the native american experience uh and then in just indigenous experience in general so um yeah i, I that i didn't clue into that just because I'm used to the term tribe outside of that and having an, a very narrow um, understanding of that word in its sort of history. So that didn't even occur to me. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point to bring up too, but I just thought I'd throw it out there in case anyone else had, it had rubbed anyone else the wrong way, like it had our other listeners. Mm. So one thing that I found when I first looked at the book the first time I like picked up this book I think it was the last year at some point and I was reading it is I thought the book was going to be about uh animal species with different genomes that would mark similar from the cover autistic individuals because of the cover so I was like oh got a real silent spring look to it (laughs) Right, because there's like birds and butterflies. And I was like, oh, fascinating. I wonder if they're like the future of neurodiversity. Are they going to tie like the diverse natures of of the animal species and how they have like evolved, right? And it's more beneficial to the species overall. This is based purely on this picture, right? I was like, oh, that's not at all what was in the book. (laughs) Like not even a little bit. Well, you know um, what they say, Jackie? You can't judge a book true. by its cover. Oh, my gosh. Do they say that? Somebody said but, that. But And I even remember I had the book, and I hadn't even read it yet. And somebody's like, what's it about? And I, like, totally said that. <laughs> like, oh, genetic diversity. <laughs> they're like, really? Yeah, they're like, really? yeah. <laughs> and then later they're like, I read the book. It was nothing like that. I'm like, I know, too. I'm reading it right now. <laughs> I think also, from what I understand, the word tribe was chosen because it's a word that's used within the autism rights movement. Like there are groups, especially in the early 90s, that called themselves the tribe. Mm. And that was another thing that Silberman talks about in person is that a lot of this conversation started with people with adults with autism in the early 90s getting the Internet and being like, wait, do I still have autism? Mm. Because I'm an adult and all of the medical science is about right. children with autism. Mm-hmm. So I think that's another reason that he just used the term tribe in that it wasn't his term. It was one that's that was fair. used already within the world of autism. And yeah, not to not yeah. trying to like pick that point. It's just <laughs> I think it's I think it's pick again, it, it just it. it just I just it just goes to show that I don't think he would be that based on my experience of having seen him and read like his 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 heart and soul that's been poured into this book. I think that he is more the type to pick a title based on 
the group that he's talking about and how they talk about themselves rather mm-hmm. than championing some title that he's invented or coining a new word. I mean, just again, I know, Danny, you kind of want to make sure that we're not getting too into the book critique versus book discussion. But so a couple more kind of book critique uh, points. Uh, so certainly this book was very well lauded when it came out in 2015. It was well, on a, a number of best number of best of lists. It won the the Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction. It says on the book cover, if you have an old version, it won the Samuel Johnson Prize. Just found out the other day. They renamed the prize. So I don't know what that means. Same he's prize. Won. It's the same they prize. They twice. They renamed it. Winner of the Samuel Johnson Prize. Winner was the other Slash Bailey, Bailey Gifford, Gifford prize. prize. It's a British prize, <laughs> Two prize. for, for nonfiction won. writing. Uh, he won an a, a award from for author of the year from ARC in 2016. Uh, and, you know, so a lot of the reviews I read online so, you know, like New York Times uh, review I was looking at, they really loved the book. I think they had some of the same critiques we had of like, it's, sometimes it seems like it's going off a little too long, maybe could have been shorter. I both paradoxically think sometimes it goes on too long, but I wish it were also longer at the same time. Like it needed more, but also maybe not some of what was in there. I wanted it shorter so that more could be said about some of the other areas. And again, that's, you know, my own you know personal can I, bias. Can I add an anecdote here? Sure. So when Harper Lee wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> I've stolen this anecdote oh, and yeah. I've used it so many times with people. <laughs> well, maybe you all already know what I'm going to say anyway for our listeners. So when Harper Lee wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, she didn't want any editing done to the book. So she added an entire chapter that was completely out of place about Scout's birthday party. And when she submitted it to the editor, the editor said, this book is great, except for this one chapter about Scout's birthday party. I don't think it fits. And she said, you're right. Let's take it out. And that was all the editing that was done to that book. So perhaps Steve Silverman planned for there to be a Scout's birthday party chapter in this book, but the editor left it in. (laughs) That ham radio chapter. You got to keep it, Steve. It's the crux of the book. Or it's an example of the kind of the kind of society and the kind of conversations we might live in if we had more neurodiversity in what we talked about. Right. I, I, I mean... Yeah, I, know. I have I'm ADHD, and so I'm really known for my tangents and being, being like, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, let's backtrack 30 minutes to our original point that I got us off of. So, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you because I feel like there is there are several rabbit holes in this book that our author went down, and they're sort of celebratory of going off track. Yeah. Right, if, right. if there weren't so many names, I wouldn't have mind. Like, I, I would yeah, only find I, it annoying when he'd be talking about like a family or a researcher, and then he'd go off on a tangent about a different researcher and not use their full names. And I'm like, wait, who are we talking about right now? So I would lose track. And sometimes they'd be talking about researchers from, you know, maybe 10, 20 years in the past, different continents. And it would make it a little harder to follow what I feel like overall was a very fascinating narrative of sort of the history of where we are in terms of, uh, you know, autism treatments in terms of our conception as a majority society of what autism is, what the autistic community considers themselves to be in terms of their, you know, continued, uh, you know, work towards, you know, you know better equality and better um, services, better you know, balance in our society and how we, you know, how we can be more neurodiverse. So sometimes it would lose me. Um, and not, not, not in a boring way. Like, I don't want to hear about what you're talking about, but I just, I really struggled sometimes with like, who are we talking like about a, now? Maybe like a family tree mm. would have been helpful, you know, yeah. or like a house but of not leaves, like a relative. you know, how sometimes they'd have like house of leaves, they'd start doing a chapter and then they do a bunch of footnotes that were sort of related, like almost like I'm going to talk about a different researcher. I'm going to do it in the footnotes now. So you got to read my little footnotes for a while. Yeah. Like that almost would have, would have made it easier. Ta- yeah. Time so, would have been great. would have been a little, cause I would lose track of who we were talking about and what time period I was in. Yeah. But I'm not very good with names. I think that connects to the fact that he's a science journalist used to writing articles in magazines because each one of these chapters kind of has that feeling, yeah. but then tying it all together, it's like, whoa, this is a lot of information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It I, is. <laughs> I actually noticed when I was reading it that I would read it in the chunks, right? And then I couldn't, I couldn't go chapter to chapter because I lose myself. So I'd have to stop at the end of a chapter or at one of like the pre in within chapters, right? When they're like the Roman numerals, I would stop, like walk away and come back and be like, all right, what am I going to read now? As if it was like a new book that did help though, because then each chapter was kind of like a new start 
as if I was doing the research myself, which is kind of what it felt like to me, right? That he had like in his yeah. office, he had like stacks of paper and he was like, okay, 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 yeah. okay right? <laughs> She's picking up the papers, everyone. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you, you definitely could, do, could read this book as, I'm curious about the history of where the diagnosis of autism even came from. Oh, read these three chapters. You got the whole story. Uh, or I'm curious about this, you know, sort of the, the burgeoning field of neurodiversity advocacy. Oh, okay, well, these two chapters, you know, cover most of what you're going to need. Like, you can read the whole book, but you could just read these two. You're going to get about 80% of what you want to know. And and so in, in that regard, I, I think it is sort of funny in that it's not a textbook. It's not a magazine, series of magazine articles. It's a science book, but it also kind of doubles as a modular series of not exactly vignettes, but, but, um, you know, stories. It's a science it? journalism book. That's, that's why it, that's it. It's got, yeah. you've got to balance giving someone a narrative so that you, you access and then throwing all the like, the psychological researchers names out there for the people that want to be, Oh, what did they do? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they can go down that path themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think the big thing is there's not a book like this before he publishes it. There's not a book where you can go, what is the story of autism in terms of the history of the diagnosis? What is, what treatments are out there and which ones are yeah. kind of quackish. Yeah. So he really is having to do spin a lot of plates in, in writing this. That's very true. I, you know, just to finish up kind of discussion of any sort of criticisms of, of, of the book, um, I, you know, I went on Amazon and I said, what, what do general readers think of, you know, after I looked at the, the main publishers, what does what do Amazon readers look like? And it did seem like there were groups that loved the book. Then there, the, the folks that would sort of give it like the one star reviews, because you're always curious, we've given anything a one, like you'd really hate something. To, to, Didn't come to on write. time. Well, yeah, <laughs> my book was damaged when it, no, it, uh, a lot of it seemed to be um, there were actually some, it seemed like individuals, autistic individuals who disliked the book from the standpoint of kind of, you know, n- nothing with us without us. You're, you're going to tell me the story of where autism came from. You're going to talk to me about uh, advocacy and the growth of advocacy. And while I do understand, you know, I, I can't understand that point because I'm not, I'm not coming from that, from that, from that perspective in that um, history, it is one of those situations that it would have been great to have an autistic individual write a book like this. But, you know, as it hadn't happened, isn't it better that somebody started this this ball rolling of, of like putting a lot of this information all in one place for the majority of individuals to read and learn about so that we can get, you know, more scholarly work in this vein later on? You know, again, that's my two cents and they, and they account for, for for that much. Like I could see why that would be a criticism. Um, anti-vaxxers did not like this book. Course even they though did. I mean, they didn't even spend a ton of time. I was surprised. I mean, cause I know when we were coming up, it was all anyone was talking about was Andrew Wakefield gut theory. And it felt like it was almost a footnote in this giant book. Like it just didn't, it didn't come up very much. And I was shocked because it felt like 90% of my learning about autism when I was you know, starting out in special education and, and behavior analysis, it's like all we were talking about for that, I guess, you know, I the grand scheme of it was exactly like, you know, a couple of years. Period. Yeah. Yeah. That perfect storm time. He references it, yeah. Yeah, I was say I he re- when having seen him in person when he talks about that area, he's very succinct. Andrew Wakefield yeah. lied. Yeah, <laughs> that's all we have to say about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess with historical perspective, you're right, Alan. Like we don't need to spend a lot of time. Like oh, and then this, it's like you know what? It's a lie. It didn't count. Why are we going to yeah. talk about it too much? If, if you yeah. want to read a pretty thorough and I think interesting account of the autism wars, you can read "Autism's False Prophets" by Paul Offit. He does a really good job. Is there a book called Autism Wars, though? Not that I know of. Let's not name it that. Oh, I don't know. That sounds like, ooh. And then recently I was reading an article about COVID vaccines, and Paul Offit was uh, quoted. I was like, oh, look at that. (laughs) Still getting work. (laughs) There was one other group, and this actually was, um, I think it was a, a, a researcher from Johns Hopkins who also was a little critical of this book, and I kind of saw uh, his point in that he did get the sense that Steve Silberman actively hated Leo Connor, like had like a personal beef with him. And while I do think he tried to be like, I'm going to just share the information, I'm just sharing the facts, it was really hard not to read any section or any part with Leo Connor and not feel like Steve Silberman's like, this guy, Leo, I hate this guy. Like he just <laughs> seems so angry at him. Well, quite frankly, good, because Leo Connor gave us some of the worst ideas about what caused autism that that would every 10 years come back up. I'm working here in Wisconsin. 
I have heard a school report to a family that, well, I, we don't think that they have necessarily autism. We think that you are a cold parent. What? Yeah. So Did like, you check your watch I, and say, I'm sorry, what year? Is this 1972? Yeah, like, like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like those ideas are out there because of Connor. And so hate on him for perpetrating bad science, especially since he had the Frankels with good science there and he cast yeah. it aside. Yeah, they, they really came out as, as, he, as real, real unsung heroes in this book. I actually yeah. found some articles afterwards uh, when I was sort of looking up like Frankel, I'd like never heard, uh, not, um, not Victor Frankel, who's a, a, a psychologist, like famous psychologist, many, many people probably read in, you know, undergrad psychology, but um, Georg Frankel Georg. and, and, yeah. uh, and, and, and Vice, and there, there were like at least two think piece recently published articles on like, why is no one talking about how great these folks were? Like, they were amazing. Like they really nailed so much of the idea of autism being a spectrum. And in terms of how can we provide treatment to autism that isn't just do what the majority does versus what are the strengths-based approaches that we could use? And it was, I don't know, it, it, we should probably get into the history because otherwise we're just going to start, you know, going on a tangent about the history we should be talking about. <laughs> if someone wants to read more about George or Georg Frankel, there's a great article from European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry from 2020 called George Frankel, An Undervalued Voice in the History of Autism uh, by uh, Filippo Moratori, Sarah Calderoni, and Valeria Basari. It's really good. And I'll cool. make sure to share that so that you guys oh, so thank can. You. That might have been one of the so ones every time I, I saw, saying, but I it's so great to have George, a citation. It's not pronounced George. That's what I you guys are saying. I believe he's from, he was from Vienna, so I believe it's Georg. Like in The Sound of Music, Georg. <laughs> Alan, that is totally where I was thinking of. But he's often listed as George. It's often been Americanized. It's, but it, in yeah. Silberman's book, he does spell it Georg. So yeah. with no E, no extra E on right. the end? Okay. Yeah, at least in at least in the book. Got it. That I missed that. Okay. One of my favorite parts of this whole discussion of, of Connor was when he's like, and now he had the perfect opportunity to do what was right. And he didn't. He actually did the exact opposite. That was like two sentences, and I was like, "Oh damn!" <laughs> no, I, and 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 I kind of agree. I think we're all kind of in agreement that there were many things that Leo Connor did wrong. I, I think the only thing that I, I I wasn't even disagreeing. I just wanted to be like, I'm going to be a little critical and think like, mm, could there be more here, or could this be uh, like a minor bias? Is it? It did sometimes feel like. It was Leo Connor did this because he was an egomaniac and he needed to be at the center of it. That may very well be true, uh, but it's sort of one of those uh, hypotheses that it's so long ago that it's hard to it might be it's, it's harder to sort of make that case. And certainly, you know, Steve Silver might have talked to people. Uh, he need to talk to people who I think knew Connor. So it's not totally outside the realm of, nope, this is a spot on description of who this man was. Um, but I, I think it's hard when we talk about like the forties and start putting, uh, this is why they did it. It's like, well, that's so long ago. Like who remembers, but anyway, let's get into the book. Uh, so we're not going to go chapter by chapter because as I think, as we talked about, some of the chapters are a little bit more, they feel like they're more flavor text, uh, or, or that that's too dismissive. I, um, they're sort of hypothesizing and discussing, points that I think are great for the thesis of the book, but they themselves might not be great discussion points because there are a lot of uh, guesswork, you know? So certainly chapter one's talking about how long has autism been, been, been in our genes? How long has it been in society? How many people have had autism and we didn't know about it or we called them something else, whether it was schizoid or just mentally ill or crazy or whatever the term was because we didn't have the uh, interest or the tools to determine it was something else. Or we, we, we just didn't care back then because, you know, we were too busy farming or whatever needed to, to have happened. Um, and there are a lot of chapters, I think, that, that cover that in this book. Um, but, but they're harder to talk about because there, there are a lot of, it, it seems like a little bit of guesswork. Well, the further back you go in history, the less you have to go on. Exactly. I mean, how would it well, be a guesswork? Nobody knows Henry Cavendish from the 1700s. They can't tell us what they really thought I about him. I loved that that starter story, though. Did you? Yeah. Okay. That, that was actually my favorite chapter in the entire book, I think. I thought it was an excellent chapter to start with, right? Because it laid out, I think, the premise of the book, mm -hmm. right? In a really nice way. Um because I was like, oh, what are we what are we getting ourselves into? Especially since I thought it was going to be on birds. 
right? (laughs) (laughs) Where I'm coming from. Um, But I loved that chapter because, you know, like it, it highlighted how, how, you know, how different contingencies can be at play in an environment and how that necessarily doesn't matter to the global, like the larger culture, the larger society, right? As long as there is some give and take in society. And I just really like that piece. They're like, oh yeah, he hangs out here, right? We know we we know what he's he's not gonna like talk to us. He's gonna jump in and out, and that's cool. That's cool. He loves science. It did read like the royal, you know, science society was sort of understanding of like this guy was such a genius that it was okay. Right. To, like, you know what? That's fine. If he doesn't want to talk with us, we'll we'll, we'll wait. We'll wait for him. Like we'll be we'll be accepting of him in the way he he's going to discourse you have discourse with us that was yeah that was the sense i got and and i really like that too because it set the stage so nicely to how that's how society should be right we should all be accepting of how everyone is and you know if they don't want to do anything at that moment well, let's wait until they're ready and and i think that i think helped me like get into the mindset of the rest of the book and progressively but i loved that chapter mm. No, and it's it's important because it sets us up for the idea that there are certain areas in society that have always been better able to flex their rule, make the rules flexible for people that are different. And the sciences are definitely one of them. And, uh, you know, it also shows that he's a science writer because Cavendish and his story was really in the zeitgeist of like the history of science Mm -hmm. in the last like 20 years because he is just so different. Um, that yeah, like he's, he's a good character to like go down the rabbit hole for to be like, what did this guy do? You know, he's measuring the gravitational constant with real giant lead balls, but also couldn't talk to like women who were in the same room with him. So there's a rich story to be told there that applies to the way that, um, we think about people today. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and to give everyone background, uh, he only would take walks at night. He wore the same sort of outdated, lavish coat all the time. He only ate Green. the same meals every day, mm. right? He lived alone. And the other thing I thought you were about to say, Alan, was that he came from a very rich family. So yes. eccentricity is for the rich and has yes. been for a long time. Mm-hmm. So you know, variances from social norms are often more accepted and thought of as sort of interesting Mm -hmm. for folks who have the means by which to live alternate lives, right? Versus if he had not been born into that situation, likely he never would have even had the opportunity to learn the things that he did. Which is why the 90s Silicon Valley is a nice sort of segue from where we start our story in modern times. Yes. (laughs) We hope you enjoyed our preview of the book club discussion of Neurotribes by Steve Silberman. As we said at the top, if you'd like to hear the full two-hour podcast, as well as access to other special bonuses like a bi-monthly social meetup, head on over to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track where you can sign up at the either $5 or $10 level. We even have a tier for folks who'd like to join us like Alan does on our book club podcasts. You can also get access to discounts at the CE store, as well as the CEs for no additional charge for listening to our book clubs. We have Neurotribes, which you just listened to a preview, as well as an older one on meaningful differences, and we'll be continuing to put those out every few months or so. Thank you so much for listening to this preview. We hope you'll join us on the Patreon page and join us for our next full-length episode. Until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye.